Well, thanks Mergiani for the invite and thanks for the kind introduction, Dave. Uh, pleasure to be here. I've known both of you for quite a while. I don't know how long. Dave, probably 15 years. Mergiani, probably almost 10 years. And we've started trying to collaborate in the last three years. So it's a real pleasure. So I'm at National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is located in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And we're part of the Department of Commerce. Um, so I'm gonna give you a one slide overview of NIST, uh, talk about the philosophy of cell viability, talk about the ASTM working group that Dave alluded to on cell viability and scaffolds, and then talk about some other applications of the model scaffold cell assay system. So NIST is in Gaithersburg, Maryland and Department of Commerce. So the focus is on trade and the mission is to promote innovation and competitiveness through measurement science standards and technology. So we're a measurement lab. Um, that plaque up there shows the bill that instituted NIST in 1901. We have a budget of, of about $1 billion. Our, we have about 5,000 staff and 3,000 of them are PhDs. So it's a real nerd fest at NIST. We're all science all the time. And we've had five Nobel laureates. On that bottom right image, there is a sky view of NIST and 270 is that road along the bottom there. And it's about two miles from where the cursor is to the other cursor. So the campus is about two miles across. So we have plenty of room to grow. So cell viability in the scaffold, why is it important for tissue engineered medical products? Um, because they're often composed of a scaffold, a three-dimensional template that's been seeded with cells. And the mechanism of action for the device is that the cells would build a new tissue, either through the process of proliferation and deposition of matrix or maybe secreting factors to um, recruit other cells to generate tissue. And these mechanisms require live cells, which is a common and important measure in um, for cell viability in a scaffold. So, or for tissue engineered medical products. The problem is, is that the scaffold interferes with many measurements. It affects the diffusion of reagents and the scaffold can interact with reagents by binding to them or affecting enzyme kinetic. And if you're imaging, it can obscure imaging. So the definition of cell viability is a really slippery concept. Um, defining life is really difficult. So from multiple sources, we, we're defining a cell as a cell with an intact membrane, the capacity for metabolism, motility, proliferation, and reaction to stimuli. And tests of cell viability would then probably focus, should focus on one of these attributes. Um, there's probably hundreds of methods for assessing viability, and each method will have its own unique measure in, meaning that they measure different things, different aspects, different cell attributes related to viability. And this means that since they're measuring different things, that they may not agree with one another, which is a really important concept for um, cell viability. So measure is a really important word for people that work at NIST, and it's defined by the VIM is the quantity or property intended to be measured. And the use of the word intended is really important because it may not be possible to measure what you want to measure and what you measure may not be what you intend to measure. There could be artifacts. Um, so it's what you intend to measure is your measurement. So it doesn't matter if you measure it or not, whatever you intend to measure is what you're measuring. That's what you're trying to measure. So that's your measurement. That means the measure and is personal and it can't be defined for you. And it is what you say it is because it's defined as whatever it is you intend to measure. Now, the problem is, is when you're talking with people, everybody has their own idea of what the measure and is and what it means. And it makes it, makes it hard to talk to one another. Um, so it's really important to have these discussions about what you're measuring when you're talking about complex things like tissue engineered medical products so that everybody's on the same page. Um, this is a slide about how each measurement has a unique measurement and they measure different things that may not agree. So in case one, you could have a, 
a cell under a given stress and it might have a high dehydrogenase activity as detected by MTT assay and you'd conclude it's live, but its membrane integrity could be poor and tripan blue could permeate it and you could conclude it's dead by a tripan blue test. The same cell under a different stress could potentially have low dehydrogenase activity as measured by MTT and you conclude it's dead, but yet have an intact membrane by the tripan blue test and you would conclude it's live. Um, so this might apply to lots of different measurements of cell viability and they may not agree. And so that's an important concept to keep in mind when you talk about viability. Uh, there's this nice review on um, measurements of microbial viability and it had this slide of, or this image, this, this figure about the continuum of life, which I, I like it, shows how the the transition from alive to dead is a gradient. It's not a binary event. And things can move down it and then back, go back up it, or maybe there's a point of no return. And there's different attributes going from live to dead. And um, some of these may be exhibited by a particular killing mechanism or a death mechanism. You know, if you kill the cells by leaving them on the bench top too long versus lysing them with the detergent versus giving them a toxin. Um, and so these events could also be um, switched up. They could be occur in a different order. You could have a leaky membrane before you have DNA degradation or DNA degradation before you have a leaky membrane. Um, so that's also important to keep in mind when thinking about viability. And I like to make these charts to try to um, show the relationship between the different um, pieces of knowledge or the different things one's concerned with. So the work I'm going to talk about today is about measuring ATP in cells that are in a scaffold. And so presumably ATP per cell is proportional to viability. But really no one cares about cell viability or ATP per cell. What they really care about is something else. And if you're thinking about a tissue engineered medical product, that may be clinical efficacy. So all your characterization is directed towards clinical efficacy. You're trying to gain information about clinical efficacy. But depending on who you are and what your interest is, you might not even care about clinical efficacy. If you're an investor, you might con be concerned about profitability. Um, if you're a manufacturing technician, you're might be concerned about product quality or consistency. So making them all the same and you're using this as a measure uh, during manufacturing. If you're a patient and this is a, a drug screen for toxicity, you might be concerned about safety or whether or not a drug's safe if you're using a 3D model. Um, if you're a bio ink manufacturer, I bring this one up because we've been talking to a lot of bio ink manufacturers. You might be concerned about selling bio inks, which means you want to know if your bio ink is going to harm cells. And so the, the relationship between what you measure and viability is a little shaky. Um, it's open to interpretation. And then the measurement between cell viability and what you really care about um, is also another assumption being made that's a little shaky. There might not be a direct correlation between ATP and viability or a direct correlation between viability and whatever it is you care about. So um, I just think it's important to keep these things in mind because every time we talk with people about these types of assays, um, we get tied up in knots trying to sort out these, these types of, um, this type of confusion. So the ASTM working group, um, the goal is to advance measurements of cell viability in manufactured tissues. And we wrote out five main steps with a bonus six step. So Establish a working group of stakeholders to guide the work, develop a model scaffold cell assay system, validate the system, and then assess reproducibility with an inner lab test. And then use that information to write an ASTM standard meth test method. And at the same time, we would like to use uh, the scaffold cell assay system for other research projects to advance other methods. This is a timeline of the work. Uh, we started talking with the group in 2018, um, we started some wet work at the end of, in, in the middle of 2018 at NIST to develop the system. Um, we kind of finished that towards the end of 2019. 
we did a lot of um, writing up the protocols, which will be published with this. And we did a lot of data analysis and compiled everything. We've generated figures for a paper that I'm working on now, and I'm a little behind on writing the final protocol for the working group. Um, so we can start the interlap study, but that's where we're at right now. These are the people that have participated. Um, the first 10 are going to do the wet work and the bottom four have been participating, but weren't planning on doing the wet work. So we're going to do it at NIST, uh, Lucy Kuhn at University of Connecticut, Kai Ming Yi, Esmail Jabari, you can read them all. Carla Divieto is at INRAM, it's the measurement lab for Italy. Um, John Wang is at Well Bioscience, and they make the hydrogel that we're using. Dave Kennedy's at uh, National Research Council, which is, is the Canadian measurement lab. Um, you can see Terry Rist down there. He's on the um, phone today. He's from Promega, and he's advised us on their assay that we're using, the Cell Titer Glow ATP assay. It's a luciferase acid assay. Um, and you know our good friend Rignani. Um, and some folks from ASTM. So this is an overview of the system. Three components, the gel, I guess there's four components, the gel, two assays, and the cells. So the gel, we use the glucose-based polysaccharide gel. It's vitro gel, it's a shear thinning gel. We selected that, we wanted to use something that was synthetic, so it could potentially have better consistency. Uh, we talked a lot about using collagen um, and we're, we've done some work with that as well, but for this work, we focused just on, we decided to use something synthetic. It's shear thinning, so it can be disassembled by some gentle pipetting action, which is useful because we can do our assay with the cells in the gel, and then we can pipette them and release the cells and assay them as well. So we can do control experiments to confirm that cells in the gel are giving a similar response in the assay as the release cells. We use these two assays, Cell Titer Glow 3D is a luciferase um, enzymatic assay for ATP. It's luminescence, so light is being released. Um, we liked it because it gives moles, uh, not an arbitrary value. Moles are a good unit for comparing, and it's also been widely used for release of hematopoietic stem cells for clinical use. So. It is used for release in human, for human use. And pico green DNA assay is a fluorescence assay. It's been around for a long time as well. It's uh, also attractive because it gives grams as a unit. Um, and so the final assay results would be moles of ATP per gram of DNA. And we're measuring the DNA is a measure of cell number because you really need to know, you can't just know moles of ATP. You have to know how many cells it's coming from so that the intracellular um, concentration is being represented by the test result. And then your cat cells. Your cat cells were so selected mostly because they're human and they were convenient to use. Um, you can get them from ATCC. They have thousands of vials of them, so we can all use the same lot. Colleagues have reported reliable performance. Um, they're a non-adherent cell, so they won't undergo anoikis in the vitro gel. The vitro gel doesn't have any adhesion sites, so uh, if you put an adherent cell into vitro gel, presumably it could undergo a noicus, um, which is a cell death related to preventing adherence of an adherent cell. But the, the Urcat cells are a suspension cell line, so they are okay for the suspension in, in the inert gel. These are just some pictures of the gel as we have used it and they were taken from a 96 well plate. So those are 50 microliter gels. You can see them on the end of a spatula, just showing you that it's actually gelling. Um, this is another slide to show that it's gelling. This is the vitro gel, a rheological test that John Wang did for us using our conditions. So it's the um, vitro gel being gelled in the RPMI medium that we use. So across the bottom there on that left plot, you can see time. And then on the axis, you can X axis, you see modulus and you can see water doesn't increase, but the gel with RPMI or the gel with RPMI and FBS, these both gel. Um, so an increase in modulus over time when they're mixed. 
These are images of the vitro gel from the scanning electron microscope. These are dehydrated samples. So you have to remember hydrogel is mostly water. So this isn't probably how it looks when it's hydrated, but it gives you an idea of what it might look like. You see these polymer rich regions. Um, they're probably polymer backbones all clumped together into some polymer dense regions. But when they're hydrated, they're probably, um, you know, they probably have chains so they are diffused out into the liquid. You can see the, the pores in them are quite small, smaller than a micrometer. So a cell's probably not able to um, move around in this gel very well because the pores are very small. On the left there, you can see a diagram of the geometry of the assay in a 96 well plate. It's drawn roughly to scale. You have a 50 micrometer gel with your cat cells on the bottom and then a 50 microliters of covering medium. And this is how we tried to do all the assays. Um, over here, we have the scheme of the experiments we did at NIST with the input from the working group on how to validate the assay. We did um, three types. We did spike-ins, disassembly, and putting everything together down here at the bottom of cells. So the spike-ins where we put ATP in the gel and run the ATP assay. We put DNA in the gel and ran the DNA assay. We put known numbers of cells in the gel and then ran the ATP and DNA assay separately. Uh, we also did the same set of experiments, but we then disassembled the gels by the shear thinning step. And then we also did the whole thing where we put everything together. So we put the cells into the gel and ran both assays with the calibration curves. Um, the standard curve, so we can calculate ATP per DNA. So I'm only going to tell you about the grade in ones. I'm going to skip the disassembly because it's just too much. This is an overview of the protocol. Um, we have three treatments, gel, HRPMI, and RPMI. Now, you don't necessarily have to do them the way we did them. We did them this way because we found that for our gel system that the ATP per DNA was dropping during encapsulation. So we had to take a few steps backwards and try to figure out how to encapsulate cells. I have a feeling that um, a lot of systems are like this. And the, uh, we've tested uh, another system and we found the same thing, that the, the encapsulation process stresses the cells and their ATP per DNA drops by roughly half. So we had to do these experiments where we, where we um, we're tweaking the system. I'm not going to go into all of them, but we spent probably three or four months just tweaking the system, trying to get a situation where we would get the similar result of cells in the gel and cells in medium. Cells in medium is just the regular cell culture process. So, you know, we're using that as our baseline or the truth for what a live cell should look like in this assay. We have this HRPMI, which the H is for high H, H2O for water because it's being diluted with water. So RPMI is just cells or ATP or DNA, depending on the experiment in RPMI. The gel is the gel stock mixed with RPMI. And then the HRPMI is water with RPMI. And it's just a dilution to mimic what the gel is. So it's the same dilution of the gel as a gel condition, except there's no gel. And that's because you know, if you change the osmolality, you're going to affect um, the cell's health. And for the experiments, we then would spike in ATP or DNA or cells at this step, um, either into the RPMI or here or here, depending on how we were doing the experiment. And then after we do that, we um, put them in the incubator for 30 minutes. Then we add 50 microliters of covering medium and then incubate an hour in the incubator and then run the ATP assay or the DNA assay. So for the ATP assays, we just add the cell titer glow reagent to the top and then read luminescence. For the DNA assay, when we're spiking in DNA, we add picogreen and read fluorescence. When we add the cells to the DNA assay, we have to do a digestion with proteinase K and SDS, and then we add the picogreen reagent and read fluorescence. And so for this, for this test, they're actually not, not done in the well, we have to remove them um, due to the volumes. Um, so the gel is actually being disassembled in this one due to the shear thinning. But here the, the gel would stay intact and here the gel would stay intact. And the ATP assay has detergents in it. So when you add it to the, to the well, it dissociates the cells um, or lyses the cells, unlike the DNA assay. 
We ran the experiments in replicates of four, and all the experiments were run three times. This is a summary of a lot of work that I'm not going to talk about, but FBS has high ATPase, and we found that we had to include FBS um, because the FBS would um, help improve ATP per cell. So the cell's health was better in the presence of FBS. Uh, we had all these treatments here to increase ATP per cell. We had to do the gelation step in the incubator. We had to change our dilutions when we were making the gel. Um, we also had a lot of work with the standard curve. When you, If you include FBS in your cell culture and you run a standard curve, then you want your standard curve to match what you're doing for your cell culture, then you would love to have FBS in your standard curve. So we figured out a way to make a standard curve with FBS present, even though the FBS has ATPase, which degrades ATP. Um, and then the proteinase K SDS digestion, we did experiments with the DNA spike in to demonstrate that the DNA was not being degraded by this step. So that's a lot of work that um, I'm not gonna cover. So I'm gonna dive into those ones I highlighted in gray. So the ATP spike in. So for this experiment, you've got the 96 well, with a gel in the bottom that's 50 microliters containing DNA and then 50 microliters of covering medium and it's in incubated. And then we add the cell titer glow reagent and read luminescence. And that's the kinetic results up here for the one micromolar ATP. And then these are the results down here where we're showing you different concentrations of ATP. We did all our readings at one hour and that's because there was this equilibration phase um, these circles are the gel with ATP, and there's an equilibration phase as the reagents diffuse into the gel and find the ATP and the luciferase reaction gets rolling. It takes about 15 minutes. You can see that peak with the circles here is around 15 minutes. So we just, for safety, just to be consistent, we always did all of our readings at, a th at, at one hour. And so all of these data down here are from one hour. You can see here the gel with no ATP. These are the gray circles, gray triangles, HRPMI, that's the diluted um, cell culture medium, no gel. And then RPMI is your control with just culture medium, again, with no ATP. These gray ones, they're all coming along the bottom here. So you're not getting any background luminescence. And then HRPMI and RPMI, these are the um, ones with ATP, but no gel. And you can see those are all kind of plotting up here together. And the signal drops because the ATP is being consumed by the luciferase reaction. And so we ran this three times and we, I'm showing you some um, R squared values over here for the fits to this plot. And you can see the lowest one we got was 0.98. So, um, and that was for the gel. So gel is obviously noisier um, than the ones that are just in the liquid, which is HRPMI and RPMI. And so that's good because it showed that the you could you could run this assay with the ATP in a gel. Um, you know, we weren't sure that was going to be the case when we started this work. So, you know, we're honestly, I was surprised how well it actually worked. Um, I figured there would be um, this kinetic curve would look different and these curves wouldn't overlap. And I wasn't even sure that it would be usable. The data would be usable, but it turns out to work really, really quite well. And then the HRPMI versus RPMI is just showing you the difference um, when you change the medium composition because one's the more dilute, um, lower osmolality. And you can see this um, dotted line here is the HRPMI. So there is a slight change. Um, I mean, depending on how particular you want to be, you don't necessarily might not have to run a separate standard curve from that one, but, but we did. So this is the same thing. As I showed you on the previous slide, except of an, instead of an ATP spike in, we, we've put in, an, put in cells and then again run the ATP assay. So up here you can see in these circles, you can see this equilibration phase is more pronounced now. You're, more stuff has to happen. It's not just free ATP floating in the gel that has to diffuse around. It's now the cells have got to get lysed and detergents going down there and lysing the cell. But again, we took all of our readings out here at an hour. Um, so that's what's shown down here, different cell concentrations, and then the luminescence is at an hour. Um, again, you can see these R squared values here. The lowest one we got was a 0.81. Again, for the gel, the gel's noisier. Um, more things have to happen. It's obviously a noisier system. And uh, again, I thought these results when we first got them, 
I was surprised at how well they looked. Um, it, um, the, the, the assay works surprisingly well in the presence of a gel. Um, there is again a slight, um, there could be a slight effect on this dilution as you add the HRPMI for RPMI as you compare them. And you got a nice linear response, a relatively linear response for the different cell concentrations. So next, DNA spike in. So I just showed you ATP spike in and then cell spike in with the ATP assay. Now I'm going to show you DNA spike in, the DNA assay, and cell spike in with the DNA assay. So the kinetic plots above here, it's actually not really a kinetic plot because it's not a kinetic assay. It's just a fluorescence assay. So any changes you see up here are some kind of degradation. And then down here is the um, different concentrations taken from a, re a fluorescence reading at one hour. Again, we did all our fluorescent readings at one hour, so there would be plenty of time for the, the dye to um, find the DNA and fluoresce. You can see it's noisier here. Um, it goes up and it kind of reaches an equilibration. It's not as clean as the ATP assay was. Um, might recall from a couple slides ago, I said that the DNA spike ins experiments were done in the presence of the gel because we didn't have to do the degradation step or the, the digestion step, excuse me. Um, for the cell experiments, the gel actually isn't present when we're doing the fluorescence readings. Um, so this could also be some scattering because there's a gel in this well when we're reading the fluorescence, whereas these HRPMI and RPMI samples, they don't have a gel in that well. So over here on your R squared values to these, these fits here, you can see the lowest one we got is for gel, 0.89. Um, next is cells in DNA. So cells are spiked into the gel, 50 microliters of covering medium. This one we had to do the digestion with the protein ACE K and the SDS, so we couldn't do it in the well, and things had to be transferred, which means the gel's been dissociated by the um, shear thinning mechanism, and then we add the dye, the fluor. And so here's the kinetics here. Again, you can see this degradation um, as the signal's dropping. Um, maybe it's photo bleaching. Maybe the dye's being dis um, degraded somehow. You can see there's a background signal here from the ones without. The, again, the grays are, they had no cells, so these should be their, this is your background signal. And then these are the readings from one hour down here for the different concentrations of cells. Again, we took the three experiments and you can see the lowest R squared we got was for the gel. The gel is obviously the noisiest and it was 0.74 with the, the mean values 0.86 for the three gel runs. So those are all the spike in experiments. And then we put it all together in one big experiment. And this kind of mimics what we hope to do in the interlab study. The interlab study would be simplified from this. Like I said, you don't have to run the HRPMI if you um, are already, already confident that your um, gel isn't affecting viability or ATP per cell as we measure. Um, also, you may not need to do multiple time points for the interlab because we're just really assessing reproducibility and um, we could probably do that with a single time point. But anyway, um, we wanted to test the, these different things um, in the validation work um, that will be in the paper. So on the x-axis for both plots, we have ATP per DNA. We've done the experiment for one hour, 24 hours. We've run the experiment three times for each treatment, and we've done the gel HRPMI and RPMI. And these are means with standard deviations from uh, N of four. I'm not showing you the individual data points here because the assay is not multiplexed. So we make eight gels for each um, treatment, and four get used for DNA, and four get used for ATP. And then these are the means of the three experiments with standard deviation. Um, the one hour experiment, you can assume the cell number really isn't changing because it's too short of a time for any significant proliferation. But by 24 hours, the cells are proliferating. So, you know, you don't know exactly how many cells are in there anymore. Um, you, I mean, you can estimate based on the proliferation kinetics, but you don't know for sure. Um, these are all the results 
um, compared by the um, ANOVA. So gel versus HRPMI, gel versus RPMI, and HRPMI versus RPMI. And this is experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, and then the means. And then this is one hour and 24 hours. And this is all being done for the ATP per DNA, so femtomoles per picogram. And you can see our low, lowest values were 0.6 and 0.07 here. So again, I was pretty pleased with this. I wasn't sure we could get it to work out quite this well. Um, the ATP per DNA is roughly 0.8 femtomoles per picogram here at one hour, and you know, roughly the same at 24 hours. So that shows you the work we did on the ATP DNA and cell spikings, and then putting it all together like we're going to do for the interlab study. Uh, we wrote all this up into a, um, each test we wrote a, like a three or four page detailed protocol with reagents and all the little steps we did so that um, we hope to publish that as a supplemental file. I think it could be, I mean, the main reason to do this was to, so that, you know, a tissue engineering company that's trying to do this for their construct could see a very detailed um, example of how we did it. I mean, not the maybe the best way or the only way, but you know, a well-documented, well-written up, thoroughly described way. Um, that's about 20,000 words and 54 pages those. Right now I'm working on the protocol for the interlab study and, you know, trying to figure out exactly what I need to order for everybody or who's gonna buy what and how much of each reagent. It's, it's a lot to think about. It's more than I honestly um, had. Uh, it is a lot more work than I thought it would be, so. I think this slide just summarizes what I already said. Oh yeah, some other values of this. I already mentioned these two. Could be used as a training tool for a scientist that's learning to do these assays. And then, as I mentioned, the model scaffold cell assay system could be used as a test bed for other measurements. So I'm going to touch on that in the final few slides here. I think I have four slides on, on, on that. And then I'll wrap up. So optical coherence tomography, you probably know it's a Imaging method, you probably heard of it. It's been around for a long time. Uh, we wanted to use this model system to look into using OCT to measure viability. Uh, and some colleagues of ours at NIST had published a paper. Um, and you can use a speckling dynamic measurement with the OCT. The OCT sees changes in refractive index as light goes through um, matrix of different phases and the cell has a different phase. Um, so you can get a a contrast there. And then the intracellular contents of the cell are moving around in live cells. So it causes the contrast to change inside live cells and you can measure that uh, and use that as a measure of viability. And so they had demonstrated the proof of principle. Um, they did high resolution work and they were looking at single cells. We wanted to try, try to do something higher throughput that was large volume so that it could be used as a quality metric for a scaffold. Um, it's relatively non-invasive. It's just light. It can image large field of view. The, the setup that we bought is kind of low, low magnification, so we can get a, um, a cubic millimeter imaged. The voxels are about two by two by two. Um, and we did three treatments. We did cells, live cells in the gel, dead cells in the gel, and gel only. And we're using the same system as I'd already talked about. And that was kind of the reason to do that is we already have these the ATP per DNA assay that we can use to confirm our results. As I told you, and you know, if you just buy a gel and put cells in them, you really don't know unless you do some careful experiments and look at the viability. You don't know how the encapsulation process is affecting the cells. Um, so that was kind of the value of that having that system to look into OCT. We killed the cells with formaldehyde for this experiment. We're also doing some other killing mechanisms. I'm just going to show you the the formaldehyde work. You can see we put them in these strip wells. This is the OCT imaging them. These are the gel only, dead gel and live gel. This is a video. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I hope you can. Um, over on the left here is the, the gel, the polysaccharide gel, seeded with live cells. And then in the middle here is with dead cells. And then on the right here is just the gel, no cells. And the top of the gel, you can kind of see it here and here and here. And these videos are about a millimeter across and a millimeter high. 
And over here, you can see these white blobs. You can see them, they're kind of speckling on the left. And then in the middle, you can see the blobs are speckling, but not as much. And then over on the right, you can see some blobs that are just artifacts in the gel probably. And they don't, also don't seem to be speckling. And this is a, uh, these, these videos, are, it's a cycling and it's a two minute video and there's probably like 10 or 15 frames for the whole video. So you're looking at like two or three minutes of, of data. Um, and so then the idea is we do a bunch of image processing to quantify that speckling. Um, we're still kind of tweaking it. Uh, we're almost done. We, we started writing the paper. So hopefully we'll have the paper submitted in, the, in the, by summertime, I'm hoping, maybe even sooner. This is a uh, sampling of the data. So we again, we took the live cells in a gel, the dead cells in a gel and the gel only, and we counted live cell objects. And we, we can't count dead objects because artifacts, blobs that don't speckle look just like dead cells that speckle. So we're just counting objects that speckle. So objects that have a change in refractive index. So this is just a live cell count, not a dead cell count. And so for our current method, you can see we're getting pretty close to what we would expect. This green is the mean of eight, eight samples that we looked at. And then that dotted line is the number we would have expected based on how many cells we seeded into, in, into that gel. So we're getting roughly 475 live cell objects when we would expect 525. And then we get some, obviously, some. there's always some background counts in the dead gel and the gel only. So we're counting some objects there that appear to be live cells. I mean, they're obviously not live cells, but in our, our screen, they're coming up as live cells. And over here on the right, you can see we've plotted in a 3D plot the centroids of the objects. And so this allows you to do an analysis of the three-dimensional distribution of live cells in a chunk of your scaffold, roughly a millimeter by a millimeter by a millimeter. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, I'll just wrap up now. So we're using the um, system, the model scaffold cell assay system for some other applications also with OCT. Um, I told you about the first one here, dosimeter for proton therapy. So there's, we've got some colleagues at University of Maryland in there at the Proton Center and they wanna develop um, better protocols for irradiating tumors and they want to move into 3D models and they wanted to test our system and then use given doses of protons or radiation and then look at cell killing. Um, so we might be able to do that with our model system, with our assay, and then maybe with the OCT. And uh, they also want to try organoids. Um, here's a image of an organoid. It's a hollow ball of cells. We're Again, just doing a proof of concept at this stage shows that we can image them and then we were going to do a, a trial to look at the speckling to see if we can segment out the, the, the basketball of cells and then use the speckling metric to determine the viability before and after irradiation. Um, 3D bioprinting, I'm bringing that example up because a lot, a lot, a lot of people are interested in looking at viability in 3D printed structures. They want to look at their 3D printed structure and look at the printing process has affected the cell health or um, with resected tissues. And they also want to look at bio inks. I used that example before of the bio ink manufacturer. A lot of people are interested in biocompatibility of bio inks. And so, you know, the, the model cell so, scaffold assay system and the vitro gel. The vitro gel can be 3D printed, but then we could extend that to other systems as well for 3D printing. <clears throat> and you're all familiar with our good friend Mergnani and colleagues, Boris and Dr. Halper and electron paramagnetic resonance imaging. We were gonna try to do some validation work with Mergnani, but the pandemic has um, obviously screwed that up because we can't get to Chicago. But the idea was to use the the assay they had developed where you look at oxygen consumption of a scaffold and then you cap it and seal off the oxygen and watch the oxygen drop. And so we were going to do that with either the at, uh, with the um, and confirm results with the validated system, the Yurkat cells in the gel. And, um, you know, we could change the number of cells or um, the size of the gel and do some experiments to look at oxygen consumption based on distance from the media or how long the tube has been closed. 
So hopefully we'll get a chance to do those. And then we also did some um, fiber optics experiments where we were using other fiber optic sensing mechanisms to sense cell health or um, metabolites. So with that, thank you for your attention. I certainly need to acknowledge Diane Bienick, Allison Horenberg, Deepika Aurora, and Greta Babahanova who have helped do all this wet work at NIST. Um, and the expert input from the working group that advised on all the different steps and stages of this project as we moved along and still have quite a bit to do with the interlab study, which um, I'm hoping we can get kicked off uh, this spring. So thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to try to answer questions. Thank you, Carl. I really enjoyed the talk. And my question is uh, that how do you go from here to the unknown biomaterials? Let's say you have developed the assay, you, we can get the cell viability in this particular combination, your kid cell with the vitro gel. Now I have a different cell type with different biomaterial. How should I translate this into well, obviously, if you could use the same system on a test method for test method development, you could run them side by side. If you want to change um, the cells or the biomaterial, then you could try to follow the process that we followed. And um, if the results were acceptable, then that would work. I mean, it, it's hard to say what acceptable is. You really have to think about what your application is if you're a tissue engineered if you're, try, if you're trying to make a tissue engineered medical product in your company, I mean, what level of um, variability is acceptable? Um, and, uh, you know, what you can even achieve, it may not even be what's acceptable, it might just be what's the best you can do. So you might have to um, run a couple assays and see which one you think gives you an acceptable variability. Um, the ATP and the DNA worked well in this vitro gel. Like I said, it's relatively inert. It doesn't really have anything on it except the polysaccharide backbone. We have tested it in um, collagen hydrogels, um, the pure call, and the ATP assay in our hands worked very well with that system. The DNA assay we haven't done much with. The first couple trials we did were a little wacky. Um, so there may be an interaction where the dye or the ATP or the enzyme, or no, sorry, the DNA dye is binding to the collagen. We didn't really trouble get around to troubleshooting that yet. So, you know, unfortunately, it's probably going to be a case by case basis based on each system. Um, yeah. Thank you. I hope we mm. will be able to do some experiments here this summer. Uh, please unmute yourself and. Uh, yeah. Hi, Carl. Yeah, this is a very interesting Good. talk, Carl. I wanted to ask you um, if you have a hypothesis for why the FBS improves the ATP content in your cells. Yeah, uh, I don't really. I mean, the I've screwed around with experiments without FBS and for adherent cells, the cells looked different in the morphology in terms of, I think back then I was running the WST1 assay, they looked the same as cells cultured in, roughly the same as cells cultured in FBS. So in terms of viability from that test, um, I didn't see an effect. For this test, which is measuring ATP, not enzymatic activity, we do see a, did see a drop in our samples without FBS. Um, obviously, FBS is good for growth, and the cells don't proliferate as well when you don't have the FBS. I mean, that was the reason I was taught that we include FBS. So again, when I've done my experiments with adherent cells without FBS, they don't proliferate. They adhere, they take on a really widely spread morphology, but their viability seemed to be fine. In this test, this ATP test, um, there was a drop in ATP, but I don't really know why. I mean, the cells should be viable, but maybe their um, ATP per cell changes. I 
I haven't really read much about the intracellular concentrations of ATP and why they fluctuate. I have seen reports that they do fluctuate and can fluctuate. So yeah, that's, that's my knowledge on the matter. Do you have an idea? Yes, I wanted to suggest, although it's just a, um, kind of, from my perspective, um, a hypothesis that is uh, naive from the perspective of cell culture, but um, FBS apparently is pretty high in lipids. And I have done a lot of work uh, in a modeling area that suggests that lipids are very important for oxygen transport. And so it's possible that you're providing a medium that allows for more rapid oxygen movement uh, through the medium. So I don't, I don't know if that could be possible, but it's an interesting question. Hmm. I have not heard that. That's interesting. That's new to me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Carl. This is Dave. Um, hey, Dave. Nice, nice talk. I enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, um, have you used this this system to to try and quantify like um, decellularized tissue or you know to see if you've decellularized what that you removed um, cellular components such as DNA or 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 other components? Hmm. No, I mean the answer is no. I'm trying to think about how you would try to do that. Um, decellularized tissue is opaque usually. Um, I mean, not always, I guess there's different forms of it. Right. I mean, I guess if you had a, made a gel out of proteins isolated from decellularized tissue, you could potentially do it. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of like the, you know, the cell matrix or the, um, that, that you would normally have left over, not, not in your sort of idealized system with this gel that you know um, works well, but if, if, if this could be used as sort of a measure of how well you've decellularized your tissues or your, your um, matrix. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, when you ask it that way, I'm not sure how it would work. I mean, our system, we build it, we're putting, we have the gel, we have the cells, we add in a known amount of cells. With a decellularized matrix, you don't really have that luxury. You mean, it starts out with lots of stuff in it, lots of cells in it, and then you do some things and you remove some cells, but you don't know how many you, you remove. So, you know, you don't really have good control cases of, you know, you need a perfect DECM that has no cells in it. I mean, you don't really have a way to make that. So I don't know how you would do that. I mean, you would have to make a, a mimic of it. You could use extracellular matrix proteins and build a system like we did, but I don't, I don't know. You'd have to think about that and if it were relevant, if you were going to try that. It's yeah. an interesting idea though. It, yeah, it was just sort of a thought with, with a lot of the, you know, decellularized matrices that, that are being produced for tissue engineering products um, where, where they, they need to figure out that they really have decellularized. Yeah. It's a good question. This is Hal Swartz. Uh, I have a, a question. So FBS has always been a, uh, uh, a puzzle to me, not that it doesn't work, but what, what it works on, because it's, it's got so many components. And it's fascinating, Sally's idea of the lipid. And uh, you, uh, that would be a game changer if, in fact, that's one of the major impacts of FBS. And in your system, you could potentially uh, test that hypothesis. I think you need to talk to Sally as to what lipids to use. But if instead of FBS, you added some lipid and got a similar effect, uh, hmm. that would really change the way we look at FBS as an additive. It's a good point. Thank Carl, you. this is Harry Riss uh, from Omega. Just a couple comments on the nucleic acid binding dyes. Um, you would expect to see a higher background in something like collagen or the matrigel. Anything that's an animal extract will have DNA contamination, and you'll see a higher background there. Okay. 
And also, just the, there's also the possibility of multiplexing by simply adding that DNA binding dye directly into that ATP detection reagent. So you lyse the cells, measure the ATP with luminescence, and then go back and read fluorescence to get an estimate of how much total DNA is there. Yeah, you've mentioned that to me several times. I, I mean, I agree with you. It's just it would require a lot of work to test everything again. So I don't know if we're going to do that now. You well, not necessarily for this method, but just, you know, for someone just doing like a one-off experiment, just something to be aware of the contamination issue. And that the multiplexing simply addresses, you know, uh, a statistically more powerful tool to make two measurements in the same sample rather than try to repeat with a separate culture plate. It's true. Just taking some notes. Yeah, your comment about the D, the collagen gels having some contaminating DNA is interesting. I'll have to look at it in, the, in that light when we go back to that. It'd probably be similar for decellularized material, although we've never tested that here that I'm aware of. I mean, there's definitely DNA in decellularized material. We've bought some of the clinical grade stuff and um, not for these types of experiments, but we were looking at measuring cell morphology during culture in those as a 3D scaffold. And we could see um, outlines of cells in the negative controls, the scaffolds where we didn't seed any cells. So there's definitely cell remnants and you can faintly see nuclei if you had a nuclear stain to decellularize extracellular matrix. And I mean, this is stuff that was, you know, doctors are using. Yeah. It wasn't a research grade material. So you're right, there's definitely I mean, because the treatments are, you know, admittedly mild because they don't want to destroy the native structure. So, thank you. Are there more questions? Uh, I see one in the chat box. Yes. Chat box. Uh, what are the application of bio inks? Well, um, I mean, the easiest thing to do would be to test the same system we have, but as we discussed, extending it to other systems would be interesting as well. So, you know, if you're going to use vitro gel, it would be have cells in gel that's not 3D printed and then 3D print some and then compare them with the assay. Um, but, you know, people are also interested in non-invasive methods. The OCT looks very promising. So, I mean, we're planning on doing that experiment and then also using the OCT imaging to try to quantify cell viability. So if you were gonna do a different material then, um, you know, collagen, like I mentioned, you'd have to, Unfortunately, you have to test each system. You'd have to validate each system. If you change the cells or the scaffold, you would have to um, validate that system. I mean, you, if you're lucky, you wouldn't have to repeat everything we did. You could just do the final set of experiments. Um, I mean, that's obviously what we tried. We, we, went, we dove right in and did the hardest thing first and it didn't really work. So then we turned around and went back to square one and built it up little by little by little, trying to figure out how to get the whole thing to work together. Because um, like I said, the ATP per cell dropped and for um, after a cell's 3D printed or encapsulated in a different gel, there might be a drop in ATP, a detectable drop in ATP. And if you want to um, validate that system, you, you know, the best case is to find conditions where there's no drop in ADP, so if you can. Thank you, Carl. If there are no more questions, I would just like to thank everybody and remind our upcoming webinars. Uh, so we started the series to bring together people interested in our technology as well as learn how we can apply uh, oxygen imaging and related uh, technologies into different uh, applications. So 
we just heard the call. I'll see, just, uh, I'll run it from my side. If you see my screen. Next month, I will be presenting mostly, we did experiment as part of JDRF funded oxygen measurement core project where we collaborating with four labs. Uh, they're providing islet encapsulation devices and we're performing measurements. So I'll be presenting some of the data from the core. After that, we have Dr. Hal Schwarz. Uh, he'll be talking about in vivo spectroscopy, which is the complementary technique with EPR imaging. Uh, in May, we'll have uh, Dr. Binwa, who will be talking about the trital uh, development of stable trital. Uh, with different application and biomedical applications. Uh, and we don't have preparation, but then we have a, a talk by Dr. Gareth Eaton. Uh, we have talk uh, by Josh uh, from TDS. So it's an exciting series ongoing and I hope you can join us uh, in future webinars also. Thank you everyone.